MLB issued a lifetime ban for gambling while its primary regional broadcaster neared a naming rights deal with a sports betting company. Plus, we are diving into the College Baseball World Series. It's Wednesday, June 5th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. MLB has issued suspensions and one lifetime ban for players betting on baseball. Joining me now to discuss is front office sports newsletter writer, Eric Fisher. Welcome, Eric. Hello. Great to have you back. So what do we know about these suspensions and the one ban? Yeah, so we've got uh, five players that have been penalized, mostly minor leaguers, not household names that most of the listeners here would know. Uh, Four of them were given one-year bans for their activities, and um, a uh, player with the Padres, formerly with the Pirates, has been given a lifetime ban for the betting activity, betting on baseball. And this is the cardinal sin of the game in terms of actually – betting on games that their team is involved in. Right. And that's why the one Padres player got the lifetime ban, right? Because he was Correct. betting on games that I don't think he's while even with, in the while games. With the with Pirates, their... but yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And from what I can tell, you know, this isn't, you know, corruption or um, I mean, not, not in the sense of players trying to swing games or swing outcomes that they were involved in or had some inside knowledge on for the most part, it was just, they were just betting like, you know, like, like fans do these days. And, you know, they're just, they happen to be in a job where that is, is forbidden. Yeah. And um, yeah. And that's, that's the clear thing that to play baseball This is a thing that is legal in most states in the District of Columbia that adults can do that baseball players cannot by terms of their employment. Uh, But one of the real tragedies of this whole thing is that for most of these players, the betting activity involved was literally just hundreds of dollars. This is just something that they were doing in their free time, and they've really impaired, if not outright, killed their careers because of some relatively minor activity. Now the rule is the rule and they broke the rule and these are the penalties and it was very cleanly applied. Uh, But, you know, it's sort of pulling back a little bit. This isn't something like years long addictive behavior. This is just something that they were doing, you know, on some of their free time and it just went askew. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And <clears throat> right, and you know, I don't fault MLB because they have to, no, you know, they, they have, they, have a very hard line policy here. Yeah. Yeah, the integ- the, yeah, the integrity is the thing and the rules have to be whether it's a little or a lot, the rules have to be applied. Yeah, absolutely. And it's something where you want a bright line and you want you want that bright line to be sort of too far in in the enforcement side of things because if you said oh, okay well yeah you bet but it's just a few hundred bucks and it was not on any games you were involved with and you probably didn't have any info so yeah you're you're suspended for a month um you know that obviously lets things creep further into uh, and sketchier territory begins. yeah um right and so they they have very clear incentive to to cut off that slippery slope. Uh, while we're here, uh, we got news today that Ipe Mizuhara, the former translator of Shohei Otani, has admitted to stealing something like $17 million to pay off his, you know, much obviously more serious gambling debts. Um, it's still sort of an evolving case, I understand, but what do we know here? Yeah, so he's looking at up to 33 years in prison now, and what had been originally entered as a non-guilty plea is now a guilty plea as part of this larger agreement and his cooperation with the federal authorities. And this pretty clearly codifies Mazuhara, uh, not so much necessarily as the fall guy, but as, as the real sort of implicated person here that all the investigations but been done that have sort of cleared Otani of any sort of knowledge of the situation here. And this just further sort of solidifies the fact that these penalties are going to Mazahara and he's the going to be the one to, you know, pay the penalty here, both potentially in prison time and the restitution to Otani for what occurred. Yeah. I'm speculating a little bit, but it strikes me that in the case of these minor league players, 
it seems like they were um they did something that they probably would not have bothered if it wasn't legal in you know where where they were situated and um you know would you really go to the trouble of finding an illegal bookie so that you can put fifty hundred dollars or in their case you know it's like ten twenty dollars at a time in a lot of cases in their games whereas with mizuhara it's it sort of feels like the opposite like if he had a DraftKings account uh one he might have been caught a lot earlier um you know DraftKings, Fandle, whatever but um but because he was working through an illegal bookie, he can bet these exorbitant amounts that he couldn't afford. And, um, you know, it, it feels like each situation spun out of control because of their particular circumstances. And maybe those circumstances would have found the people involved no matter what. It, it, but I don't know. I just find it striking that um, in one case we have legal betting, in one case we have illegal betting, and, and both lead to these problems. Yeah, vastly different situations in terms of the time period in which we're under consideration here and certainly the scale involved. Uh, but in both in instances, this really sort of highlights what is a, an uneasy coexistence between legal sports betting and the operation of these leagues. And there's been all sorts of data to show about how legal sports betting increases fandom of the leagues and these teams. And we've been going on and on for week after week, month after month about attendance and ratings and uh, all these metrics doing well. You can certainly point to some of that to what gambling has brought to the table, but you also have situations like this that threaten the competitive integrity. So what is, has been an uneasy coexistence will remain so. And you only have to look at other situations like in the NBA with John Tay Porter for more of the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, these these stories are just I, I don't see any particular end to them. I feel like, you know, it, it's like performance enhancing drugs where it's like the problem, it feels largely dealt with. But every year, a certain number of players get suspended uh, because because they break the rules, um, because there are incentives to do so or just impulses to do so. Speaking of that uneasy balance, uh, we also uh, got some recent reports that uh, FanDuel is in advanced talks with Diamond Sports Group around a naming rights deal. And of course, they would be replacing Bally's, which is another uh, sports betting operator. Yep. But um, but it just goes to show that the the business of sports betting is going to be, you know, just deeply integrated into every part of sports and sports media going forward and these suspensions aren't going to stand in the way no not at all and this is something with the diamond situation that's been developing for some time that we've known for really several months now as the uh, reorganization plan or attempted reorganization plan has been taking shape that bally was not going to continue with the naming rights after this year and that deal was going to end early uh we've just literally today had a status conference uh confirming that there is the new name coming they didn't disclose it yet um that is the expected uh, new party, and it sort of makes sense on a lot of, at least it's uh, predictable or understandable on multiple levels for all the reasons you just described. Plus, you add in the fact that uh, to continue to grow, FanDuel has had a lot of content ambitions. They do a lot of partnerships like this. They've got their own in-house content development network. Uh, so uh, it's sort of like all of the trend lines are sort of aligning in this new deal and then you've got a you know large scale branding opportunity like this that just happened to become available like three years early uh and so it, all the all the forces kind of aligning together um so it's very interesting but at the same time kind of like oh yeah yeah i could totally see that coming um but it's also going to be very interesting to see whether this actually kind of does see the light of day because Diamond still has to get over the finish line with right. the uh, reorganization, which is a whole other story and probably a whole other conversation for another time. Yeah, absolutely. But yes, the the real X factor here is yeah, is Diamond still going to be a thing? Not right. Not does FanDuel want in, and do they do they have the money and you know the desire? Absolutely yes to all that. Eric Fisher, thanks so much for joining us. Always a pleasure. I'm joined now by the executive director of the College World Series, Amy Hornacker. Welcome, Amy. Hi. Thank you. Great to have you on. So the regional playoffs are wrapping up. We're headed toward the College World Series. What's this time of year like for you? 
Yeah, so we the regionals wrapped up late last night um, with the UConn win over Oklahoma. So um, they were placed in their super regionals, um, and the TV times were announced this morning. So it was a little wild right out the gate here, um, but uh, we're we're just anxious to see um, the eight teams that are headed our way. Yeah, yeah, and uh, see it. Just give us sort of a lay of the land of how this whole tournament works. We've got the regionals, the super regionals, and then the college world series. So, uh, you don't have to take us through every round, but if you want to just kind of give us a basic progression of how this all happens. Yeah. So I think everybody's familiar with March Madness at basketball. So, um, we also have a similar bracket, um, and a committee that, um, seed 64 teams, um, off of, you know, their conference schedule, um, how they've, you know, done all year. Um, we have at large bids too. So all of those things are really similar to the basketball tournament, which I think people are more um, identify with. Um, and then they, they do play in a super regional round, um, which just wrapped up, or I'm sorry, a regional round, which wrapped up last night, um, which got us down to 16 teams, which will, they will, the super regionals will be played this weekend. Um, they're all at campus sites. Um, and then out of that best of three, we'll get um, eight teams here in Omaha to compete for um, the national championship of college baseball. You, you've been involved with the College World Series uh, for seven years. How have you seen it change in that time? Yeah, so I actually go way back. I was an intern here several years ago um, and then came back after a stint with our um our sports commission here in town. So um, I actually was an intern at our old, um, the old stadium, Rosenblatt Stadium, which if anybody knows anything about the event, um, it's, it was very historical. Um, we, Omaha has hosted the CWS since 1950. So um, we moved down to what we call the new ballpark, but um, it's Charles Schwab Field, Omaha. We moved down here in 2011. Um, so the, my, um, history is not as long as the city's, um, but it has definitely changed, um, over the years, uh, it, from like just basically not making any money to being, um, one of the NCAA's top revenue producing championships. Um, the popularity of baseball, obviously, um, at the college level, there's been more, um, on TV. Uh, and so it just continues to grow. Yeah, and I'm curious to dig into that a little bit more. What do you think brought it from, yeah, non-revenue generating or not, or is not profit generating to, to yeah, to a, a major driver of, of revenue and profit? I I think it's just um just the foresight of a lot of people of leaders um just getting it in front of more people. Um, we have a lot of. Um, teams that we from the SEC conference, um, baseball is really big in that part of the country. Um, and then it's just, it's just really, you know, it's found its home here. Um, we do our best to, to share the story um, along with our partners. And I think, um, you know, collegiate sports are, are, are such a thing now that there's a lot of interest um, outside football and basketball. And is um, is a lot of that coming from? I know you're you've got ESPN as your your main broadcast partner. Is a lot of, out of it coming the, the revenue? I mean, coming from media, or is it like a fair chunk of it also coming from yeah sponsors? Yeah, there's. I mean, there's sponsors. There's media impact. Um, the media um, impact has grown considerably over the years. Um, the NCAA has a new agreement starting next year where um, it will reach over to ABC. So that's um, some new stuff for us um, to be to be on like a general instead of just the cable network. Um, we also have, you know, I mean, ticket sales drive um, a lot of our revenue as well. Um, and depending on what teams get here and the following that they have. So what are the sort of the most popular teams areas uh, in terms of like really who really shows up for for this event yeah so i like i mentioned before we have a lot of teams from the sec um and that is trending the same way this year there it's, it's a different half um so tr traditionally we you know ls lsu's been a mainstay here their fan base travels for everything um even when you know we saw them with women's basketball um so we also you know the schools from mississippi but we're we're looking at um a kentucky that hasn't been here in a long time 
Um, Tennessee has been kind of a mainstay, but um, the ACC is strong. Uh, so we have um, Florida State in the mix and um, NC State, so who's also been here before. So um, a lot of teams from that part of the region. And then the Big 12 is actually playing well this year, too. So it's been interesting um, to see kind of a new mix of what uh, we might be getting. And um, you mentioned the College World Series has a 70 plus year history. Can you feel that when you're at the event? Yeah. So actually, we're celebrating 75 years next year in Omaha. So, um, yeah, it's not only is it the community support it, but um, it's a bucket list item for a lot of people. Um, I think we felt it the most um, when we, during the COVID time, 2020 was when you work on this event year round, you sort of um, take for granted how many people are impacted by it, um, you know, locally, but also just like our normal fan base. Cause we also have about 3000 season, what we call season ticket accounts. Um, so people that have had tickets since the beginning. Um, and then when we didn't have it, it was, it, you know, the phones are ringing and, and you forget just how many people um, are involved in this event. Yeah. And how many people are involved, to, you know, for this? Because uh, by the time it gets to you, it's, it's eight teams, right? So and um, yeah, and over a couple of weeks, right? And so, yeah, how, give me a sense of what that brings together in Omaha. Yeah, so we're one of the lo the longest of the NCAA championships. So we have five staff here in Omaha year round, which we're a little unique. Um, the NCAA doesn't really have local organizing committees. They have some permanent cities. Um, Oklahoma City is one. Um, Frisco, Texas is another. But we um, are really the year round only year round staff that works primarily on this event. Um, we also have the NCAA headquarters staff, which is about thirty people, um, and then our our, our like our ballpark staff um, and then our city resources anywhere from police fire to public works. So um, everything's touched our hotels. Um, we're, we're not a huge city, but we're a decently sized city, but you definitely know um, when the college world series is going on. Um, because in addition to our event, there is two very large youth tournaments, youth baseball tournaments that pop up um, that play on fields around town. So you'll see, um, little league teams everywhere. Yeah. And you know, with, um, you know, the final four, the college football playoff, this is like something that moves around every year. There's sort of like, you know, a bidding process of sorts to, um, to bring these events in. Has there been any pressure on your side to, you know, move it out of Omaha? So we actually have a long-term contract, um, until 2036, so the event um, with the NCA. So the event is here. Um, I think what if you if you know anything about college baseball, like you if you go to their locker rooms or even I saw uh, University of Texas's cleats that said University of Texas at Omaha. Like it's less about um, you know the College World Series and more, it's like the road to Omaha is kind of synonymous. So I like to think that um, even when we get close to the contract that. Um, you know, if there's other cities involved that we have a, a fair shot. So, yeah, and we've been talking mostly about Omaha, but do you feel like this, what do you think about the event's national footprint? I mean, obviously you've got a, a national broadcaster and ESPN and the, the earlier rounds are, you know, ESPN plus some on ESPN U. Um, but yeah, do you feel oh, like it's like, this is a, a national event? Yeah, I think honestly, they, they continue to expand their footprint. Um, and then it's just, yeah, it's a special, it's a national event. We have, um, we have season takeout holders from all but four states. Um, and then we even have um, Canada. So uh, it's people that have come and want to continue to come. And then, like I mentioned, these youth baseball tournaments, um, kids that are growing up playing baseball, um, you know, following teams, idolizing guys um, have a chance to that obviously I'm not sure that these U tournaments would be here if um, the College World Series wasn't here. So from all over the country. You know, obviously there's, there's a long history. You've been doing what you've been doing for, for a while, both you personally and, and the organization. But uh, what, what would you say is next? Like, is there a, a next chapter or next innovation coming for the CWS? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously it's no secret college athletics is evolving. So um, just kind of following along, um, seeing how that all unfolds. Obviously we, we have the long-term contracts, but we never want, um, to just 
you know, stay status quo. So we're, you know, we're working on some special things, um, pot- you know, potentially things um, at the ballpark. So yeah, we're all every year we're constantly trying to change things, change fan engagement, um, continuing to to grow uh, the sport in the interest of the younger generation. And what's it been like working with ESPN as a broadcast partner? Um, so they they've been great. They've been um, you know, they've been here a long time. So, um, and, and they're continually trying to evolve, um, to add different ways. We have um cams, we have a drone, like different ways to get, um, different aspects of the game. Um, and then obviously a new, um, long-term partnership with the NSA that gets us over to ABC is, um, is great too. Fascinating stuff. Amy Hornacker, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. That's it for today. If you're watching on YouTube, throw us a like and a subscribe. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.